Hello, everyone, and welcome to Truly Force Free Animal Trainings um, YouTube Live. And um, I'm happy to have you here, and I'm happy to answer your questions today. And just like always, each month, um, I will be going over questions that you have submitted and um, hopefully answer some of your questions. So before we get started, always my little housekeeping. Um, uh, this month, we are doing a special and if you listen to the podcast I did um, with Jason Zakowski, he is from the Science Podcast, super fun podcast if you haven't checked it out. Um, we talked about science and behavior. It was a really fun, exciting um, podcast. So check it out. And if you listen to it and then you answer some of the questions we have in a little questionnaire at the end, you have a chance of winning a $50 gift card to Truly Force Free Animal Training. So that means you can use it on anything. You can use it on webinars. You can use it on um, classes. So check that out and you could win and, and get a chance to check out um, some different products on Truly Force Free um, Animal Training. Also, if you're not um, mem haven't signed up for your newsletter, we always have it. So if you sign up for your newsletter at trulyforcefree.com, you can get a free webinar. So that's always available so that you can check it out. Um, you know, if you're just exploring and want to see what, what we have to offer on Truly Force Free. So, and then also if you're still looking for ways to learn more about dog training and where, where it started and where it is and why, why did we switch to this Force Free Positive Training that is um, the new way of training animals, the more science-based training, you can check out my book, The Evolution of Dog Training. It um, is a book that starts and it just explains how we started with dog training all the way through to, to the most current information when it was published a few years ago. Um, but it really is relevant on teaching you why we have gone from punishment and alpha and dominance to a force-free positive approach. So you can check that out. Um, it is available obviously on paperback, but it is available also as an ebook and an audiobook. So if you're traveling this summer, you can, you know, stick it in. You can even listen to it when the kids are in the car because it's all, you know, clean and family oriented. Um, so you can check that out. Um, and you can go to Amazon and it's available in all of those and audible there. So hopefully, you know, that will be something you can learn a little bit about and your kids could learn about it too, if you're doing a family trip. So, um, that is, you know, some of my housekeeping going on. Um, please feel free if you are on this live and you have a question while I am talking, go ahead and just type it into the comments. And if we have time at the end, um, I will answer those. And if not, then they'll just go on to next month's questions. And then if you're watching this as a recording, you can always um, email us at info at trulyforcefree.com and submit a question. You can submit questions on our Facebook, on our Instagram, all of our social media. You can um, submit questions um, as well. So we're always checking those out and then we combine them each month to help answer your questions. Because one of my goals as a as a dog trainer, <clears throat> a behavior consultant, and as a veterinary technician is I want to be able to help people anywhere in the world with positive training. Because I know sometimes it's difficult to find someone who can help you train your dog or your animal in a positive force-free manner. So I'm also available for virtual appointments. So that's something you can check out at Truly Force Free. And um, go check out Truly Force Free if you haven't already because there's tons of free stuff, blogs, videos. Um, so we just want to help people everywhere. So, um, today we're going to jump into our questions because we have a couple, um, really good questions this month that, um, it's always funny because it seems like it is a trend that it's something I talk about in my classes or with some of my private clients. And then we do these lives and, um, the questions are sometimes the same. So the first question I'm going to go over today is, um, I'll just read them for you because that way you know the context. <clears throat> I was just curious to know if having multi -dog, a multi-dog house is beneficial for the newest and youngest member of the pack because dogs learn from one another by modeling behavior. And this was um, submitted by Deborah. And um, so this is a really great question um, because there's 
there's a lot of angles that I'm going to be taking. And just like always in the lives, I can't go into complete detail um, <clears throat> because I don't know the specifics. However, I do, um, but I do get a chance to cover a lot of bases. And so hopefully it helps you. So one of the first things um, I would say is um, something I just talked to someone about last night at my puppy class is you should only have the number of dogs in your household that you can handle and care for properly. That is medically, that is training, um, time, um, you know, love, food, finances, because sometimes we love animals so much that we get too many and then they actually suffer because we can't give them the care that they need and we can't get all their needs met. So this is something that you should think about in a grand scheme of things, not just how, what is best for this younger member, but maybe you shouldn't even be getting another dog. So, um, I am a single mom and, um, I used to always have three dogs when I was married. And when I got divorced, having three dogs was a lot with three kids. And then one passed away, he had cancer and I had two, and I just have decided I can't have more than two for me, um, because I need to be able to feed them and care through their veterinary care and give them their time and their exercise and their training. So for me, Two is plenty. I don't care, you know, it, you know, what other things go because that's my, what my dog's needs are met. So, um, this one client already had three dogs and then she got to go and retrieve her puppy. And she's just, it's, it's just overwhelming for her right now. And because training him and she's working full time. So that client, you know, we talked about, maybe it wasn't the best idea, but we're going to, we're working on it where it's at. So, um, having multi dogs has to be okay in your household first. Then you have to look at, if you do say, say I wanted to add a dog to my household, um, I need to consider, you know, this talking about they model behavior. Yes, they model behavior, but they model good behavior and bad behavior. So you don't have time to train the newest member and or your older dogs or your res um, residential dogs don't have proper training. They have bad habits. Say they bark at the door, they bark outside. That newest member will potentially model that behavior too. So now you're not only going to have one dog that has problems, but now you're going to have more dogs that have problems. So it's really important that you think about the big picture and how well behaved are your dogs um, because they will potentially learn bad hate behavior. It's common for people to say, oh, I'm going to get a dog for my dog that has separation anxiety. And that may work, but that dog may also have anxiety um, when you leave, it doesn't matter. So you could have it with the dog and they still will ex um, experience separation anxiety because their anxiety trigger is you leaving. It doesn't matter if there's another dog there. In some cases, it doesn't even matter if there's another person there. So you need to think about the whole big picture. So um, if you have really good dogs that do really good behavior, and, and I have experienced this with my dogs because I, you know, overlap dogs in, in general. I usually overlap dogs. When one passes, I get another one. So then the older ones, because if they've been well, well trained, they know the boundaries, they know the rules of the house, the younger dog or the puppy that comes in tends to learn those because they're watching those. But it's not just, I'm not depending on my dogs to train my other dog. I'm also doing that training, but they're getting modeled also by the by the dog that's been there and already gone through the training. So getting um, having a dog that's well-trained does not eliminate your need to train them, your time, your energy, and you have to look at the personality. So some dogs just beat to their own drum. And so even if the whole group is doing one thing, you still could have that outliner, outlier who's not modeling the behavior that those other dogs are doing. So now not only do you have your dogs that you've already been working with, but now you have to do extra work with this other dog. So having a multi-dog household is very um, dependent on your situation. The other thing I want to mention um, about this question is that... Um, Multi-dog household, some dogs don't want to be with other dogs. There are dogs who prefer to be only dogs. Um, they're just not super social. They're not really into playing all the time. Maybe they only want to play with you or they don't mind going to the dog park, but they don't really want to live with another dog. Um, I have had dogs like that too, who um, I you know, get a dog and the other dog actually gets depressed or frustrated or starts acting out and poorly be uh, beha poor behavior because um, 
they really didn't want that extra dog. So um, just because you want the dog doesn't mean your dogs want the dog. And then you, but I think the most important thing is what do you have time and resources for? Because that's the biggest thing that um, dogs oftentimes get rehomed is because they're not a right match. So you're a couch potato and they're a hyper, hyper ADHD dog, or you're an ADHD dog person and the dog's kind of a couch potato. So personality mismatches um, are where rehoming happens a lot. Also, if they, people bite off more than they can chew. So they get an extra dog, but they can't handle it. They can't afford it. Um, they don't have time for it. And then that dog ends up getting rehomed sometimes, or they just, you know, don't get the, all their needs met. So, um, so I, there might be more to that question, um, Deborah, that I'm not hitting, but hopefully I tried to be broad enough that I could answer all of your questions about that. So Deborah also had another question, um, <clears throat> which is something that we've kind of talked about, but this is a different angle. So I kind of like it. So it says, what can be done about a puppy about six months who, um, six months old, who is a border collie mix and does a lot of muzzle punching. So muzzle punching is where they take their muzzle and maybe they, they pinch you. Maybe they're not nipping, um, where sometimes border collies and Australian shepherds and some other breeds will um, nip your heels because that herding instinct comes in and that's what they would do to cattle or sheep. Um, so, but if they're not, it sounds like this border collie is not actually nipping, which is good, but they're still doing the muzzle punch. So it's almost like a, a threat or a push or, um, you know, a similar thing. They're just not using their mouth. So I would give this um, suggestion and, and kind of talk about this as the same as I would with attention seeking barking, or if they were actually nipping at your heels. Um, a six month old puppy is still learning, doesn't really understand a lot, still needs a lot of supervision, confinement and um, structure. So um, if I have a dog that I'm dealing with this one, I would want to make sure that the dog's getting plenty of rest and um, they're not too tired. So sometimes mouthing and some of these behaviors can happen if puppies aren't getting enough sleep and puppies need about 18 hours of sleep. So 18 hours is a really long time when you start to think about it. And that means they need lots of naps and their naps need to be somewhere where they take a full nap. Sleeping on the couch or sleeping on a dog bed while you're walking around is not full sleep because they're probably halfway awake and having one eye open. You know that if you leave the room and they follow you, you know, they weren't sleeping well. So, um, sometimes that means putting them in a crate or a bedroom to sleep. So sleep is a big part. I see a lot of behavior problems because puppies don't get a lot of sleep. Pre-COVID, I saw this with people who were worked from home, um, homeschooled, or were retired. So people who were always home, I saw this a lot. Now with COVID, because so many people work from home and people switch to homeschooling more, um, more people retired, I'm seeing this in, in more cases where dogs have these behavior problems. And a lot of times it's just they're the people are either too helicopter, so they're all in their business, or they are um, off and um, they're not letting them sleep enough because there's no quiet time in the house. So those, first of all, you want to make sure that they're getting sleep. So let's assume that this border collie is getting plenty of sleep, and this is not a fact of a tired teenager um, or toddler. So then we want to look at is there certain circumstances? Is there a trigger? Is it a, is there a, um, something that triggers the behavior? And then the consequence is probably you turning around, yelling at them, giving them some form of attention. Even if it's negative attention, it's better than no attention. So oftentimes I will see this. The person says they walk down the stairs, or they walk up the stairs or they walk down a hall or they walk in a certain area and the dog starts nipping or, you know, getting at their heels. Um, and then they turn around and they say, stop it, you know, no, 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 or give them some kind of attention, even if it's negative attention. And so then um, that dog goes, oh, well, that's a way to get their attention. So if it's an attention seeking behavior in a specific area, one thing you can do is start teaching them to like sit, stay, down, stay, um, do something else as you walk down the stairs. So when um, my first dog, Missy, um, when I was a teenager, we lived on a two-story house and she would like, you would go down the stairs and she would run and almost like try to beat you up and down the stairs. So that behavior obviously was dangerous. I didn't like it. So what I taught her to do is sit at the top of the stairs or the bottom of the stairs while whoever was going up and down the stairs. And then we released her or asked her to come after we were at the top or the bottom. 
So if it's a specific situation like that, where it's stairs or a hallway, you can ask them to sit, stay down, you know, do something and you go and then you can release them. So then you're taking away that trigger in that environment. Um, if it is something where they're kind of bored, um, mental stimulation is really good for this. And, and as a border collie, I think every border collie also, I think every dog needs this, but particularly these working dogs who are living in our homes that aren't living on farms and working like they were bred to do. We need to make sure we're providing enough mental stimulation. So we oftentimes think about exercise. So we walk them, we run them, we play ball with them. We um, do all this physical exercise. We don't think about the mental capacity that's not that need that's not being met for these dogs. So in that situation, um, I for my all puppies, I recommend this, but even more so for the herding breeds is I feed them out of food toys for every meal. So a food toy could be a Kong. It could be a Kong wobbler. It could be a kibble nibble ball. It could be a buster food cube. Um, it could be a, um, if you check out truly force freeze, um, kids corner, you can see a place where my son is making a dog toy, which is just a soda liter bottle and he's cutting holes out of it. You can also do it as a milk carton, put holes in it, put the kibble in it. Now they have to push this bottle all around in order to get the kibble out, which takes more time. It gives them something to do. You can also toss treats in your yard and let them sniff for it. You can hide treats in your house or in your backyard. You can hide stuffed Kongs, um, make an Easter egg hunt. Um, so there's a lot of things you can do to, to really mentally stimulate these dogs. Um, if you have a dog that's really struggling, so say this Border Collie is doing this behavior a lot and they're getting their sleep, they're getting, you know, 30 minutes, maybe, maybe an hour most for exercise during the day. So they're getting exercise, they're um, getting plenty of sleep. Then I would be really looking at how much mental stimulation are they getting? Um, there's also snuffle mats and leaky mats. I mean, the food toys go on forever. And if this is a big problem, instead of feeding two meals a day or even three, I might take the kibble amount so say you feed, I'm just going to say a cup a day, instead of feeding a half a cup in the morning and a half a cup at night, I would feed maybe a quarter of a cup four times a day. And then you could also stuff a Kong with it. You can put some other things. Um, you can give them some treats. Um, so you can make it so um, they are thinking all throughout the day. They are looking for their food. They're foraging. Then that need for mental stimulation is being met. So I'm going to look for specific triggers and try to prevent them. Um, I'm going to make sure they have their exercise, make sure they have their sleep, and then I'm going to provide a lot of mental stimulation. Um, that will also help. Then um, what I might also do is um, redirect them. So if it starts to happen, try not to give them attention for it. So if you can stop you know, um, cross your arms, put your knees, you know, put your feet together, turn around and face them. Cause a lot of times they do this from behind, turn around and face them and just wait, just give no attention, just be very neutral. And then if they offer a behavior that's like sit or something, you can, uh, you can reward that and tell them good. Or if they stop at least doing it, then you can redirect them and have them sit, um, or do something else. So maybe they walk with you. Um, maybe they have a spin behavior, something that redirects their brain. So they're no longer thinking about, um, you know, getting to those ankles. And then border collies are very smart, just like a lot of our dogs that we work with and making sure you're also doing training regularly so that you have a way of communicating with them. So sometimes we expect our dogs to be perfect at sit, stay down, come, leave it, drop it. Any, all these things we, we spout out to them, but we never teach them what those words mean. And then we don't have a way of really communicating. So then we're just yelling at them, but it's almost like we're yelling at them in a different language and they don't understand. So training is really, really important to make sure that you are involved in that. So um, that means daily training. So if we're getting our sleep, we're getting our exercise, um, we're doing the mental stimulation and um, we're... Um, doing all of these other things. The other thing we need to do is make sure we're doing training every single day. If you don't have a positive force-free um, trainer in your area, we have on 
um, Truly Force Free Animal Training at trulyforcefree.com, a good manners course. So you can go through a whole good manners course and teach those basic skills at your own pace. So you could do a little bit every single day. We also have a at-home agility course where you can build your own jump and you can do a jump exercise and you can do it anywhere. You can do it in a living room. You can do it on a patio. You can do it in a backyard. If you don't have a lot of space, you can do it because they're one jump exercises. Uh, there are also, um, you can do our foundation course. There are some other different things that you can definitely check out so that you have, um, can do some training all the time. So that's another big piece of what you want to make sure you're doing. And, and so if you get the good manners course, you know, every day, you know, work on some of it and it builds on each other. So as you do each segment, so maybe you're just working on sit, but then maybe work on sit down and you can go at your own pace. So, um, if you're busy, maybe you just work on sit for a day or, um, you can start teaching tricks. So there's a lot of things you can do, but, and that also helps your bond when you're doing that training. Um, so those are a lot of suggestions for one question. And like, again, I don't know all the details of it. So sometimes if there's a detail, I can, um, tell more, but, um, hopefully that kind of helps. If you get all of your dog's needs met, they're less likely to have behavior problems. Um, because all, because they, they're happy and they're, and they're content. Um, so I'm going to go to our last question and we still have plenty of time. I was just checking, um, is, um, how do I get my dog ready to go camping with us if they've never been camping before? And I love, love, love this question. I'm an avid camper. I love camping. Um, my current dogs are old and it's too hard for them to camp. Um, Captain's back is so bad that if um, that would just be too much for him. And um, so he stays home with a, a pet sitter who stays with him. But previously I would camp and I love camping, um, but I don't like camping when I camp with, um, if there's campers that have dogs that aren't really ready for camping, the ones who bark all night, the ones who bark at everybody, um, you know, if they're, they're having fun and quiet, then I love having dogs at a campsite, but they have to be prepared. Um, Camping is a very different experience for humans, but also for dogs. So depending if you have a puppy or a, a rescue dog, um, regardless, you need to get them exposed to different environments. Now, if you have a puppy, you want to do this as soon as possible for their socialization. If you have a rescue dog that's older, this may take a little more time if they have negative experiences going to new places. So the first thing I always suggest to my um, clients who say, I really want to go camping with my puppy or my dog is I tell them you need to go to different parks all the time. You need to go to different beaches. You need to keep taking them into all these different environments that there's different smells, there's different textures and make sure they're comfortable there. Bring high value treats, do some training. When you first go to these new environments, don't expect them to be good at sit down, come stay, even if they're super fluent at home, because they're going to explore the smells and all the sights and all the sounds. So get them really exposed to all these different parks in the area. Um, you may start on short visits. So maybe they're only like 10 or 15 vi minute visits at first. I would then work up to doing a day camp. So go somewhere where you're going to picnic and you're going to be there all day because some dogs get better. They get real excited when they first get there and then they mellow out. Other dogs get more anxious as they're there for a really long time. Um, then you need to decide if they're going to sleep in a crate, if they're going to sleep in your tent, if they're going to sleep in your car, and you need to kind of get them used to um, that environment. So if you want them to sleep in the crate, make sure they are, that they're used to being in the crate in your house before you take them in the um, tent and put a crate up. Um, so you want to get used to that. If your dog is somewhat reactive, so reactive doesn't mean they're mean or bad um, or aggressive. It just means they bark, growl, and lunge or, or um, make some kind of noise when people pass or dogs pass then you want to make sure that they're comfortable with that before you take them camping because there's so many stimulus at a campsite that it's not fair to you or other campers if they're barking at everybody who passes your campground. So if your dog is reactive in any way, barks, growls, and lunges at people, dogs, um, other animals, you know, horses, you can check out our rehabilitation program. So it's a reactive dog rehabilitation program. That is also on trulyforcefree.com. And that is where um, I will take you step by step, virtually online, um, at your own pace of exactly what I would do if, if you were a private client. So 
Um, obviously I can't have the conversation with you, but you can go through all the process of what I do with a dog that's reactive. And then that way you can see it there and you can, you can practice and get them used to things. They might even, you can even use it if they're just a little scared of something. So say they don't bark, but you know, if another dog passes, they get coward or you get scared. Or if another person passes, you can do this reactive dog rehabilitation program and get them so that they're used to um, all these different um, sights and sounds. So that would be something you could do to prepare for um, camping as well. Then what I would start with is only going to a campground that's local. Um, maybe you only plan to go for one night uh, so that your dog gets used to the tent being up and all the things being up. I would go somewhere close. So if things go really sour, you can always go home or take the dog home or have another family member who can take care of the dog. Something as a backup plan if it's not, because um, if it's going sour, it's going to ruin everybody's time, but it could be going really well. Um, you have to also realize that your dogs may or may not want to eat while they're camping because if they're scared or nervous, um, you should also have your dog used to, to um, hiking if you're going to be doing hiking. Um, so you really want to incorporate them in all of these in this these things. One last thing I also suggest to some of my clients who plan to camp far away is that they get their dogs used to being in the car at long distances especially since COVID, a lot of our dogs don't really go in the car that much um, or they didn't. And so now we put them in the car and maybe they get car sick or they're scared or they get, um, they're overstimulated. So get them used to being in the car while you are going, you know, places. So they get used to that part. Something to remember whenever you camp with your dog too, unless you have a trailer or something confined, you're going to have to take them with you because you can't just leave them in a tent um, or a car while you are, you know, going and doing other things. So make sure when you're thinking about camping with your dog, is this something your dog's going to enjoy as well as you? Um, there are plenty of places that dogs are, are super welcome and it's really fun to take your dog. Uh, but there are also some places where maybe you're camping, but you want to go do tours of things that your dog's not going to be allowed to go to. If it's in the summer, you can't leave your dog in the car. And um, and if it's going to be really long hours, you don't want to leave. It's not going to be fun for your dog. So make sure you're thinking about them when you're thinking about taking them on any vacation, um, even if it's in a hotel. But getting them used to all of these different environments will make your camping experience more fun for you and your dog. And what we care about most at Truly Force Free is having compassion and empathy for our dogs and our um, human learners as well. Um, because I feel like if you don't have, if we don't have compassion for the humans, um, it's not going to benefit the dogs at all. So hopefully all of these suggestions have kind of given you some inspiration. If you have additional questions to these questions, please feel free to email, email us at info at trulyforcefree.com. Like again, you can check out our social media posts and you can also, if you if you're like, oh, gosh, I would really like to do some one-on-one, -on -one. virtual appointments are available. You can check that out at trulyforcefree.com. And if you like this video, please share it. Um, we want more people to know about it and you can give it a thumbs up, but we're really trying to build up our YouTube page and we're really just trying to get this positive force-free information out to the world so that everyone can have access to this because sometimes you go to a trainer who tells you, you know, you have to alpha roll your dog or you have to put an electric collar on your dog or something that's just going to hurt your dog and hurt your relationship. So check those out. And if you um, haven't checked out, check out the Evolution of Dog Training book. It will give you some a lot of information and a lot of people, I get feedback a lot that it helps overall training um, because they understand the philosophies. And then don't forget to check out our podcast. And this month we're featuring the um, podcast with the science podcast. And if you check that out and then you do the survey, you'll get um, signed up to be in our raffle at the end of the month. And you could win a $50 gift card to anything that is on trulyforcefree.com. So I hope that this was a helpful um, live for you today. And um, we will have another live next month. So please submit your questions. And we're hoping 
to spread our lives to all social media. So Instagram, um, Facebook, everyone will have access to this live. And then there's always the recordings. And you can go to Truly Force Free and check out the podcast on Truly Force Free. You can check out the recordings of old um, live posts. Um, but we have a lot of information there because we just want to help you help your dog. So I hope you all have a wonderful month and I will see you in August. <laughs>